Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, if I talk about this volume, I hope everyone can hear me okay? Very good, fantastic. Well, uh, per the introduction, um, my background, I'm the Latin American Research Professor with the U.S. Army War College Strategic Studies Institute. And so as we talk about drug policy today, I'll be talking mostly with a focus on uh, Latin America um, as those drug flows impact the United States, but also as they impact other parts of the world, uh, such as Europe and, and such as Asia. Uh, also, as was mentioned, I previously had the honor of serving on uh, Secretary of uh, uh, State Mike Pompeo's policy planning staff with responsibilities not only for Western Hemisphere, but also uh, international narcotics and, and law enforcement. And so uh, as I put together the presentation for a day, today, I tried to incorporate some of my own personal reflections about that experience, and yet I do uh, want to emphasize that everything that I, I share today, and I will share my, my frank thoughts and opinions, uh, does not necessarily represent uh, the U.S. government or my employer here at the U.S. Army War College Strategic Studies Institute. So with that, I um, wanted to uh, begin with a few uh, thoughts about uh, how we got to this point with respect to the, the struggle to um, deal with drugs and, and to, uh, to mute the flow of drugs uh, through the region and the impact, uh, the grave impact that they're doing in the United States. So uh, as uh, you're probably familiar from the background the reading that you've done, uh, we have actually been engaged uh, longer than we often acknowledge in various different struggles against uh, various different types of drugs that would impact the United States. We can go back to uh, some of the actions uh, against uh, the threat of, of opium at the turn of, of the last century, as well as uh, some of the early um, efforts uh, against cocaine as that first began to become a difficulty. Uh, as the readings that uh, you may have uh, reviewed uh, point out, really the current focus of our efforts um, was uh, probably best uh, thought of as beginning in 1971 when the President Richard Nixon uh, began the, uh, the, the anti-drug efforts, the, so to speak, a war on drugs. Uh, at that time, of course, we, had, uh, we were still dealing with the, the 1960s. Uh, drug culture and uh, other, uh, other dynamics associated with our, our social transformation here in the United States associated with that. And so there was a, a certain uh, heavy emphasis on that, um, those, uh, some of those types of drugs, psychedelic drugs, et cetera. But at the same time, there were also other efforts, uh, desires to decriminalize what were then seen as some of the least uh, damaging drugs, such as marijuana. Uh, some uh, efforts are more successful than, than others. But if you really remember the, uh, the era of Ronald Reagan, it's morning again in America, when we came to the, um, the early 1980s, you had uh, really new drug flows that were beginning, uh, really initially coming from Peru, um, mostly cocaine uh, processed through and, and with the help of organizations in, in Colombia uh, into uh, the, the United States. If you remember the show Miami Vice at that time, uh, that was probably a good, with uh, Don Johnson and uh, you know, the, the Miami uh, drug culture. Um, one of the, the things that that illustrates nicely is the way in which uh, prior to what is called Jihad of South, that you had many drug flows that were coming up uh, via plane and, and other medium uh, right into the Caribbean, right into the South Florida and from there throughout uh, the, the United States. At the same time, there were reactions uh, to um, that rise of, of crack cocaine or um, of cocaine, um, and also, frankly, the rise of crack cocaine. Um, to differentiate, of course, uh, processed refined cocaine at, at the time uh, was uh, largely in vogue uh, for those of, who were uh, you know, middle or upper class who had uh, more money in, in some of the, the Hollywood set. Um, crack, however, um, w became a scourge in the inner cities. It was considered relatively cheaper, but oftentimes uh, even more addictive and, and even more lethal. And so there was a sense that um, in terms of, of crime and, and some of the, the health effects in the inner city, uh, crack back in the 1980s was really beginning to have a, a devastating effect on those inner cities. And so as you recall, some of the early uh, responses that had to do with uh, campaigns to try to reduce drug uh, consumptions, uh, and really it took two different directions. There was a very active public uh, campaign to try to move us away from the, um, the, the social uh, acceptance of, of things like uh, uh, cocaine in places like, like Hollywood, of course, uh, famously, uh, Nancy Reagan and Ronald Reagan's Just Say No campaign. But at the same time, this was also the area in which there was a dramatic increase in criminal penalties, uh, not only for the suppliers, um, but also, of course, uh, for the, the users. And that helped to pave the way for what we see today, um, the dramatic increase in people, um, especially at the lower levels, the, the users, uh, incarcerated. And some of the debate about uh, whether the incarceration of, of those users did not also disproportionately impact uh, those of lower socioeconomic status who were not only um, more apt to use, but also more apt to be caught 
for that use for, for a variety of, of different reasons. Talking a little bit, however, beyond what was happening in the United States, what was happening in Latin America at the time to feed this growing US demand, especially for uh, cocaine. So one of the things that was happening, of course, was that initially you had a lot of the, um, a lot of the uh, cocoa plants that were, are refined into cocaine produced in Peru. But Peru was also in the process of a relatively successful stage of its campaign against a terrorist group called Sendero Luminoso and asserting more control over uh, Peruvian territory. Uh, and as that began to happen, as um, uh, Sendero was pushed back, and also as the, the Peruvian military uh, helped to have a, a greater footprint in, the, in the, the ground, a lot of the coca growing activity that was taken in Peru began to shift into Colombia. And that had a transformative impact. Because as that began to occur, on the one hand, you had groups like the, uh, the Forces Armadas Revolucionarios de Colombia, the, the FARC, um, and to a lesser extent the ELN and, and others wrestling with, um, do we get involved in this new thing or not? Um, and the decision, for example, by the FARC in the 1982 Congress to uh, at least get involved in protecting and extorting the revenues from the cocaine um, had a great impact because it gave those groups a lot more revenue. Um, and in many ways, it cut them off from having to be consistent in their actions with their ideological base. And so in many ways, it made them more lethal, more ideological, and it set the stage where by the end of the 1990s, um, the FARC was in a position to you know, really threaten the political continuity of the Colombian government, um, and the FARC had penetrated in terms of drug corruption and, and other corruption up to some of the, the highest levels. But it went beyond the FARC because also you had organizations um, such as, for, for example, Pablo Escobar the, the, um, and, and the famous uh, Medellin cartel and, and others. And as drugs began to be produced more and more in Colombia in some of the uh, remote areas where there was really relatively limited government presence, the people who were involved in this, as well as the traditional ranchers and others who, who owned those lands, said, well, the government isn't doing a whole lot to protect us, and so we need to begin building, um, we need to begin hiring uh, our own private security forces. And so the drugs, in some ways, as well as the FARC, helped set the stage for the rise of these large, well-armed security forces, which by 2005 um, were receiving a lot of attention for being involved in you know, abuses of human rights um, and other uh, various uh, improper uh, activities. So you had that going on at the, at, at the time. Um, and at the same time, um, one of the things that was also happening that, that's very important to, uh, to, to note is the changing role of Mexico and Central America. So in the early days, you had certain Mexican groups at a relatively low level. They'd been previously involved in, you know, in the post-World War II period, for example, helping to get heroin into the United States. Uh, indeed, actually, when opium was, was legal, actually supporting um, the, the lack of, of opioids in, in the United States, uh, as a lot of those were, were being shipped over to our soldiers and, and sailors for the, for, for the war effort. But um, you know, the whole Mexican marijuana culture and, and, and other things, as um, the Mexican intermediaries began to get involved in that. What you also began to see is that when you had the later fall of Pablo Escobar and the Medellin cartel, and then the later fall of the Cali cartel, which came after that, that really set the stage for those Mexican intermediaries to become much more important. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Another part of the route, which was very important, was Central America. Um, so especially in some of the northern triangle states, so Guatemala and, and Honduras especially, um, and to a lesser extent, El Salvador, you had um, people who had been involved in smuggling other things, um, like for example, uh, smuggling cheese, literally, um, in, in the days when there was differentials and in, in controls between El Salvador and, and Honduras, that those smuggling groups who knew the territory began to get involved in the smuggling of these other things that were, that were, taking, that were uh, occurring here. Um, at the same time, however, as you began to get more and more drugs coming through Central America and, and, and Mexico, um, and especially uh, through uh, certain, um, certain land routes there, there was a key moment, uh, 1985, when a DEA agent, uh, informally known as Kiki Camarena, was assassinated. And that really helped to galvanize in administrative circles, and thus in the, the US administration, this notion of, um, you know, we really have to step up and do something about these increasingly violent uh, you know, drug actors in the, Latin, in, in, in the Americas. So go forward to the evolution from the 80s to the 1990s. Of course, uh, Bill Clinton, uh, with his uh, changes in various different policies, did actually continue in many ways the war on drugs. Uh, you had, for example, a very important crime bill in 1994 with uh, uh, 
the, the key role of, of the, the naming of drug czar Barry McCaffrey, uh, among others. Um, during the same time, the uh, focus on incarceration continued. And so over the time, you had a dramatic increase in the number of people who were in US prisons um, on drug charges, reflecting the laws as well as enforcement. Again, as you can see, there are an almost eightfold increase between the beginning of that incarceration focus at the beginning of the Reagan era in 1980 to over 400,000 by the time we get to um, 19, 1997. As I indicated before, however, um, the, the various different efforts to disrupt drug supply chains had an important effect on the dynamics of the region itself. So again, um, in 1993, one of the, the biggest drug czars at the time, Pablo Escobar, who was really helping to organize this land bridge that brought drugs out of Colombia and took drugs through Central America and in other places up to the United States, of course, uh, you know, he, was, he was killed. Um, the Medellin cartel gradually gave way to a new cartel, the Cali cartel, which, again, had its day. And indeed, by the time you get to 1996, you have um, you know, substantial corruption of, of large numbers of people in the Mexican Congress. You had um, then President, uh, Colombian President Ernesto Samper, who was seen as is so corrupt that we were on the verge of decertifying you know, Colombia. So you just had this corrosive effect throughout the, um, throughout, throughout the region uh, there. But at the same time, you also are getting, beginning to get the evolution of Mexican drug trafficking organizations. Remember I talked about some of the, the big family-based organizations. You had one in the Pacific, the Sinaloa Cartel. Um, you had um, various different families, the Carillo Fuentes family, the Ariano Felix family, that controlled um, you know, key drug transit areas like, like, like Tijuana, for, for example, um, or, or, or Juarez. Um, you have other organizations, such as the Beltran Label Organization, on the, the east in places like Tamaulipas, so you have the, the Gulf Cartel. But there were a relatively limited number of cartels during the, this time in, in the 90s. Um, a lot of the focus was on Colombia, and, and the violence was relatively limited. So this begins to, to, to change. Um, but before I get into how that changes, to try to track a little bit with the, um, the time here, um, I wanted to point out that um, not all drugs were coming out of Colombia, and not all drugs were going to the United States. So again, just to give you a little bit of perspective, um, if you recall, some of the Peruvian drugs up until the Peruvians began to assert more control over their territory were coming through Colombia to the United States. But um, as we get into the 90s and 2000, a lot of the drugs that are coming out of Peru and Bolivia to, to the south would work their way down and would go over to Europe and to a certain extent, some of the drugs that are coming out of Peru would go to the Pacific, down to the north of Chile in places like Iquique. Um, some would get in, be actually used in Chile. Some would actually go over to, to Asia, where you had a, a small but you know, increasingly important uh, drug culture of you know, those increasingly uh, prosperous uh, states there in, in, in Asia as well. At the same time, however, um, another important activity that's, that's taking place at this time is the establishment of JATA South, the Joint Interagency Task Force uh, focused essentially in Key West in, in Miami. Now, JETA South, established in 1994, is important because it accelerates a trend that was already just beginning. So remember that the Miami Vice days and you know, drugs just flowing into Miami and the Keys and all of that? Well, basically, JATA South became an important vehicle for providing essentially eyes and ears and assets, largely Coast Guard, but also coordinating with partner nations and, and other things, to make it a lot harder to do those drug transits across the Caribbean. And so um, you can really see a, a shift with Giada South um, in that out of necessity, some of the drug producers um, and, and the drug movers began to make increasingly increasing use of the land routes through Central America that we talked about before. Um, and others start to make increasing use of other parts of the, the Caribbean. Now, another thing is happening at this time as well. So when we begin to arrive in the 2000s, one of the things that you have taking, uh, happening is uh, the transformation of Colombia. Again, remember that in Colombia, you had the guerrillas, the, the FARC guerrillas, um, who by 1998 were almost at the point of, of threatening the future, you know, the political future of, of Colombia. That was kind of their, their, their apex. But at the end of the Pastrana administration, um, and then with the arrival of uh, conservative Alvaro Uribe um, in, in Colombia, you had a new military strategy asserting control over the previously neglected Colombian countryside, going after the FARC um, and beginning to put 
mayors where there previously had not been mayors, military forces where there previously had not been military forces, government services where there had previously not been government services. Um, now, two things are important about this. Number one is that that assertion of government control over Colombian territory begins to change a lot of, of dynamics. One of those dynamics that were uh, impacted, for example, is that the previously widespread growing of, of cocaine in Colombia begins to come down at least a little bit. It went down from about 160,000 um, hectares to about 40,000 hectares uh, by, by the time we get into the contemporary era prior to 2016. Um, the other thing, though, that, that, that happens um, during this is that the campaign against the FARC, which, if you remember, was a terrorist organization, was never intended to be a campaign um, against drugs. Now, we did a lot of counter-drug cooperation under something called Plan Colombia, um, beginning at the end of the Samper era, I'm sorry, at the beginning of the, the, the end of the Pastrana era and continuing into the Uribe era. Um, but even though it was counter-narcotics cooperation, um, the thrust of the Colombian campaign was more against the terrorist organizations, the FARC and, and the ELN, um, and less so against trying to solve this, this drug problem, although there were some beneficial effects. One of the other things that was important about what was happening in Colombia at the time also, um, remember that I talked about before that when all of the drugs started getting grown and all that money started coming into the Colombian countryside, they started hiring and, and creating these private armies, um, in part to protect them against the FARC because the, the narcos wanted the drugs for themselves. They didn't want to have to pay off the FARC. Um, but these basically became private armies that were protecting the drugs in some case, involved in other criminal activities. Um, in some cases, they were actually you know, going after the FARC. In some cases, they were assassinating social leaders. Um, but by about 2005, there was an understanding that there was a need to, to get these private armies out of the Colombian countryside. So even before the peace agreement with the FARC, there was a peace agreement uh, essentially with a politically constituted grouping called the AUC of these private militias. Um, and that went disastrously wrong. The, what happened basically is that a lot of these people um, ended up demobilizing, but there were not jobs for essentially people who were you know, hired you know, rural gunmen. Um, and so a lot of them either took the benefits or didn't take the benefits, but then there was a recreation of about 32 different new militias. And so you had this demobilization, but the demobilization very quickly turned into this large number of, of other groups and private armies under new names. And so from about 2006, 2007, in Colombia, suddenly you have a much more fragmented fight between different drug groups. One that became to be known as is the Urabeños, today is known as the Gulf Clan, which became the more powerful. But there were others, uh, you know, such as the Rastrojos, et cetera. Um, there were other um, you know, small ones, uh, su such as the EPL. Uh, and you continue to, to find uh, references to these names, some in the borderlands, some in the neglected, um, you know, uh, northeast, I'm sorry, southeast coast of, of Colombia, et cetera. But again, the, the drug activities complicate dramatically um, the situation in, in, in Colombia, these, um, you know, the, the fragmentation of, of these cartels. So meanwhile, and again, this is a very complex uh, story here, so if you're, hope you, hopefully you're still with me. Um, with respect to Central America, what begins to happen then in Central America um, is another largely idiosyncratic thing. So as you may recall, there were two major civil wars that were going on in Central America at the time, a long bloody war in El Salvador, and another one that had gone on since 1960 to 1996 in Guatemala. Um, now, the peace accord that roughly coincided with the end of the, um, the, the Cold War uh, of those Central American conflicts, um, the result of those peace accords was a dramatic demobilization and reduction in size of some of those Central American armies um, in combination with a, with a reorganization of Central American police forces. Why is this important? So remember, just at a time when there's more and more drug flows coming through Central America, in part because we're focused on the Caribbean, in part because of what's going on in Colombia and in Mexico, at that time when there's critical drug flows coming through the region, um, the very authorities that would be in position to stop those drug flows, the armies are demobilizing, the police are getting reorganized, and so no great surprise, um, by the time you get in the early 90s in Central America, you not only have a significant gang problem, but you also have a significant narco trafficking problem um, with uh, some of the, the organizations that were 
from the very beginning, um, you know, old smuggling cartels. So in uh, Guatemala, some of the great smuggling families like, like the Lorenzanas and, and the Mendozas, um, in the Lopez Ortiz family, in, in Honduras it was the Cachiros and the Valle Valles, uh, among, uh, among others. Um, but there's one more stage to this, which is in Mexico. Remember, again, um, with the dismantling of the Medellin and Cali cartel in Colombia, Mexico is getting more and more important. Those groups that had been silent intermediaries in Mexico now are beginning to become more and more important in actually financing, getting precursor chemicals and, and other things from other parts of the world, including Asia, financing the movement of drugs from Colombia through Central America to the United States, et cetera. Um, and they also began to hire their own private armies. Um, so the Gulf clan famously hired a group of, of ex-Mexican military special forces who came to be known as Los Zetas, um, who then started tearing into Sinaloa territory. Sinaloa then basically created its own elite military arm. But, by the t but before much time had gone by, you had even some of the smaller drug organizations who were going out and hiring local gangs and basically allowing them um, to protect them and trying to use them to take over territory. Territory. But when you have gangs, how do you pay these gangs um, if, the drug pro, uh, if the drugs aren't enough? What actually happened then was that, in many cases, the narco-traffickers would allow the gangs to gain a certain amount of money by extorting or doing robbery or other illicit operations in the territory that they control. And so you have more and more armed groups in Mexico. You're beginning to get more and more fights between those armed groups. Um, and you're getting more and more criminality and not just kind of the quiet flow of, of drugs through Mexico. Um, now, in the middle of all of, all of that, of course, the, the situation with the violence and the power of, of those drug gangs had gotten to the point where when um, Mexican President Felipe Calderon comes to power in 2006, um, Horrible things are happening, especially in the state of Michoacan. Uh, some of the drug, um, some of the, the drug armed armed wings are, you know, chopping off people's heads and, you know, rolling them across the floors in, in discos. In, in one famous case, and and so Calderon, who was to the right in Mexican politics, decided that the way to do this was to bring in the Mexican army and confront them. Now, ironically, if you remember some of the things that we did, perhaps with not a great deal of or imperfect success in places like Afghanistan and Iraq, just like we in many ways tried to go after some of the key terrorist cell leaders, the Mexican Army and Navy tried to go after some of the key drug leaders. And they actually had a good amount of success. You know, if you remember that we, in our wars in Iraq, in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, had the, the playing cards for the terrorists, um, the Mexican had a list of about 120 leading drug leaders that they went after. But the problem was, as they began to take down these drug kingpins, it fragmented and fragmented and fragmented even more those organizations. And so by the time you get to the end of Felipe Calderon's sexenio, um, and, you, uh, and Enrique Peña Nieto comes in and basically continues many of his policies, you'd, gotten, you'd gone from about three major Mexican groupings to about seven or eight to about 300 plus groupings. Um, in some places like Guerrero, you had as many as 50 groups fighting for control over routes and what they call plazas just in one Mexican state. Meanwhile, you have um, in Central America, back to Central America, um, recall again that you had had some grave problems after the demobilizations that accompanied the, the civil wars in Central, Central America. However, um, you had some progress. So, for example, in Guatemala, in certain areas that were big drug landing zones like the jungle, uh, the northern jungle part, the, the Paten, um, you begun to get some success in asserting more control, uh, largely working with the U.S. and security partnerships. Uh, in Honduras, you had a temporary setback. Um, there was a, a president who is actually today, his wife just was elected president of, of, of Honduras. Uh, Mel Zelaya back in 2009, whose, whose, whose wife, Xiomara Castro, just became president about a month ago. Um, but at the time, Mel Zelaya, who was largely believed to be involved in, in also the drug trade as well as leftist politics, came in um, and, um, and because he wanted to promote the Constitution, um, because he wanted to get himself reelected and change the Constitution, there was a constitutional dispute in which basically the Supreme Court decided that he had to be kicked out. The military um, enforced the decision of the Supreme Court and basically invited him out of the country in his pajamas. But that actually created a, a big hole um, because it, it made it difficult for a number of, of partners, including the United States, to continue the security cooperation with Honduras. And that created a, a situation in which uh, you had a dramatic escalation of drugs moving through, for example, Honduras. Um, 
Now, during this time, there's also some other evolution. So you see that the, one of the common themes here is this constant evolution of, of routes and peoples and actors, things morphing into other things. Um, now, as you had some attempts to control the situation in Mexico and Central America, you had some increased use of some more southern routes. For example, coming out of the Gulf of Uraba in, in Colombia, basically on the, the eastern side of Panama, um, you had uh, some, uh, you know, some use of, of drug routes that actually went through Panama or along the Panamanian coast, along Costa Rica. And those states at the time also had an increase in the associated drug violence that they had to deal with. Um, you also had some innovative new Caribbean routes. So, for example, there was a tendency to um, try to send drugs across the Caribbean from the, um, you know, from the Colombian and, and Venezuelan coast up to uh, Espanol, up to the Dominican Republic, and then either over to Guatemala or, or up to the United States. Uh, and why this is relevant is what you begin to find is that in understanding these kind of human networks, that oftentimes the, the use of specific places and routes also were impacted by and impacted human networks. And so you actually, in places like New York and New Jersey, um, in Orlando and South Florida, had big communities of Dominicans and big communities of, of Jamaicans. And so as you begin to get, for example, the Dominican network, groups like the LA Kings and others operating in New York and New Jersey began to um, take on important roles as the distributors of these drugs that were coming in um, on the US East Coast. Um, in the same way, in South Florida, you had certain Jamaican groups that were playing an important role in the arrival of, of drugs there. Um, and the results of some of these routes is that even in previously sleepy um, Caribbean places like, like Jamaica, although Jamaica has never been entirely free of, of violence, you began to see local drug lords such as uh, one by the name of Dudas Koch, who became so powerful that he actually um, you know, gave the Jamaican security forces a, a serious challenge when they tried to unsuccessfully displace him from a, the neighborhood where, where he was operating. And so again, this was rippling through many different parts of the region in, in many different ways. Now, when we talk about how the US has responded to all of this, of course, it is important to recognize that you know, more, in a more contemporary sense, uh, we you know, saw the difficulty that Mexico was, was going through. And although Mexico has a substantial economy, and although there are levels of corruption and, in, um, and institu institutional imperfections, uh, Mexico um, does have very competent security forces, the previous federal police and, and the Mexican Navy and, and Mexican Army. And so, um, but you still, you had Plan Merida, which was in part about helping Mexican security forces and in part about helping the Mexican uh, law enforcement establishment. You had a smaller program which was targeted on the, the Central American countries, uh, CARSI, uh, which started just a little bit later. And then, of course, a few years later, recognizing that the Caribbean, as I indicated, was a problem, you also had the Caribbean Basin Security Initiative. Um, probably the common element of these programs was that even though they seemed like a lot of money, relative to the amount of drug money that was going through, um, they were relatively small, and oftentimes some of the, the policy limitations, who we could work with, who we couldn't work with, the way we told our partners we wanted to support them, the delays in getting certain type of aid. We did some good, but you can say it was not a lot of money, not terribly flexible, not always completely aligned with our, with our partners' needs. And so there was some help there, but not a lot of, uh, not a lot of uh, impact. I should say that during the Trump administration, um, as you probably recall well, there was a subtle shift from the focus on drug policy to the focus on immigration policy. And if you remember previously, you had had a, a real show of the significance of migration way back in 2014 with the child migration crisis. And then, of course, you had an increase at the beginning of the Trump administration um, of, of people coming in uh, using uh, asylum uh, as, as a way of getting past uh, some of the, the immigration laws. Because at the time, there's a loophole that if you ask for asylum, you would get to wait in the United States. And so there was a, a basically a policy initiative to try to keep people, basically create a situation in which our Central American and Mexican partners would agree to host asylum seekers in their countries, which of course was generated an enormous political polemic um, as opposed to elsewhere. So the policy of getting those agreements on cooperation over asylum and the treatment of, of migrants and, and refugees um, in some ways displaced some of the focus on drugs. And part of the displacement was that under the Trump administration, the president actually temporarily suspended for about a year um, some of the security and other cooperation going to Central American nations. Now, it was turned on again, and there was a race to get some of that money working again. 
Um, but again, the disruption probably, in objective terms, uh, did not help things. Um, to put one more layer of, of this on, uh, you also had, at the same time, increasing questions um, across the region, especially given the effects on crime and violence of, of, of the drugs, of, you know, would not it be better to just legalize certain types of, of less addictive or, or less harmful drugs, uh, including marijuana? And so, for example, you had a movement in Uruguay several years ago um, to legalize drugs there. You had similar movements in Jamaica, in, in Canada, and of course, as you're aware, a number of different U.S. states in, in different ways and in different levels um, have legalized, um, whether it was medical marijuana or just legalization, et cetera, to the point where we have a real patchwork today in, in what is, is legal at the federal and, and state level. Um, as this is happening, though, um, we also have one more part of the picture, which is the shift. It's not just cocaine, it's not just marijuana, but as you may recall, um, what started out as the medical drug OxyContin, um, you um, had a dramatic rise in a market for uh, basically the illegal opioids. And so you had an opioid epidemic that really hit the northeast of the United States and in the Midwest, that the Rust Belt. Um, I came from Ohio, so I say that with great love and sympathy. Um, and it, um, you know, my, own, my own home of Dayton, it's just amazing that the devastation in, in social and economic terms, um, you know, what, what has happened there. And I suspect that many of you have, have similar uh, you know, stories. Um, but on top of the opioid epidemic, um, also other synthetic drugs, not just metamphetamines, but also um, a, a very potent uh, type of synthetic drug, fentanyl, um, began to become in vogue. And fentanyl was very dangerous and attractive for a number of different reasons. One, because it was so small that you, in just in, in things like envelopes in the mail, you could ship almost undetectably very, very large monetary quantities um, and, then, and then distribute that. But also, because it was so potent, um, if you got the dose just a little bit wrong, and of course, uh, you, know, um, you know, the quality control of, of, you know, of, of narco groups is, is not well known, um, you, uh, you started getting a, an enormous takeoff in drug overdoses to the point in which um, not just raw fentanyl, but the fentanyl which has been used to lace cocaine, the fentanyl which has been used to lace heroin, the fentanyl even which is used in other substances, that the number of overdoses last year um, reached 101,000 uh, Americans killed in just one year. The previous year it was 89,000. Of course, uh, you know, the desperation and isolation of COVID-19 you know, hasn't helped, but you know, it is dramatic that the number of Americans you know, who are dying, and, and again, not just over, over the cocaine. So again, uh, to bring this now to the current situation, uh, to make a, a few uh, points here. Um, number one, of course, when we look at what's happening in some of the cocaine source countries, uh, so specifically Colombia. Again, if you remember that right before the Colombian peace deal in 2016, you were down to at least, at least a relative reduction in, uh, in coca under, um, uh, under cultivation. Now, what happened, though, is, is two things at once in Colombia um, with, with the peace deals. Number one was that the FARC, in anticipation of the peace deal, basically encouraged everybody that was under their protection or influence, hey, you need to start planting cocoa because you know, they're going to figure out who to compensate by who has cocoa. And so there was basically a boom in the sowing of cocoa in anticipation that if we have it on the ground planting it, we'll get paid not to produce it anymore. And so ironically, the peace accord caused an explosion in the planting. The other thing that happened was that um, there was a a finding um, by Colombian environmentalists that the drug, that the aerial spraying tool that had been used to eradicate that, something called glyphosate, was seen as having um, you know, toxic effects on the Colombian population. This is actually something that's used in the weed killer roundup, and so you know, it was a bit of a polemic of you know, how toxic is it or, or is it not. But the decision that they could no longer do aerial spraying basically forced the Colombian military into a much more labor-intensive, much more dangerous, much more um, difficult manual eradication of the crops, um, with the effect that the combination of decreased tools to eradicate um, and increased incentives to plant, um, on top of the fact that, frankly, um, you know, U.S.-backed programs for alternative crop substitution were grossly underfunded, and oftentimes the money went to the wrong people. Um, so the combination of those things meant that you had a re-explosion 
of uh, you know, coca production in, in Colombia with, again, a dramatic associated increase in all the illicit money that was going into Colombia just at the time that you had also a dramatic increase in violence there because of the problems with the peace accord um, and the shift from the FARC to the ELN and, and some of the FARC organizations that weren't getting involved in, in the peace. And, and, um, and actually, at the time, the beginning of the entry of um, massive numbers of Venezuelan refugees in, into Colombia. Uh, Colombia is one of those places where it's a testament to the, to the resilience of the Colombian people and, and their education that you know, the country you know, remains as governable, honestly, as, as it is today. Um, but beyond that, what you also you know, see is that, um, again, the fragmentation uh, increase continues in Mexico. Uh, and, and again, um, in, in Central America, there is fragmentation occurring there as well. Remember, I talked about some of those big drug families in Central America, which was somewhat similar to the big drug families in in, in Mexico, but as they went after the leaders of those families, relatively successfully after about 2015, 2016, you get more and more groups there. So for example, in Guatemala, you had as many as 30 to 40 different groups who were managing little individual valleys and controlling those, um, and, and oftentimes you know, fighting against uh, each other. Even in Colombia, with the government going after some of the big narco groups, uh, such as what I mentioned before, the, the Gulf Clan, including just recently, just last October, um, who, the, the person uh, who goes by the name, the, the nom de guerre Otoniel, who is basically Colombia's version of Osama bin Laden, you know, this, this big narco, um, in a massive operation involving um, numerous helicopters and was planned for, for years, um, they, they, they finally got this guy. Um, but with the weakening of the Gulf clan, you have the fragmentation of, of other clans, and so the situation uh, the situation continues. Um, farther complicating things in Colombia, as you recognize, um, increasingly uh, neighboring Venezuela has not only hosted some of the Colombian criminal groups, such as dissonant members of the FARC, who are continue to be involved in, in drug trafficking, but also the ELN, who continues to be involved in, in illicit mining, um, and some of the other lesser groups that I mentioned, such as the EPL, otherwise known as the Pelusos, uh, among others. And so as this has all been playing out with Colombia, Venezuela, um, that has not only further complicated Colombia's ability to fight um, and limit that production, but it has also led to a shift in routes. And so some of the drugs that used to come out of Colombia, out of the Gulf of Uruba, now can go over to Venezuela and then come up through the Caribbean from Venezuela. Uh, some of it can go across the coast, Venezuela to Guyana, um, to Suriname. Um, uh, Suriname is actually a country in the north of Latin America. The Surinamese ambassador used to have this wonderful card that would show Suriname as a big red block on, on the northeast part of South, South America. So if you learn one thing here today, it's that Suriname is actually a country in, in South America. It doesn't get as much attention as it should. Um, but it was formerly a Dutch colony, which is one of the reasons why a lot of the drugs that came through Colombia, Venezuela, to Suriname, actually Suriname in its capital, Paramaribo, was a jumping off point for the sending of drugs into, in, into Europe. So you can see how this is, uh, is becoming more complicated. And also, um, the turn to the left that we're seeing across the region, not only the authoritarian populist left in places like, like Venezuela or Bolivia, um, but also um, the um, you know, other states who may have decreased uh, incentives to cooperate with us. A few other things important to, to note is the effects of COVID-19. And so again, if things were already difficult in this war against drugs, COVID-19 made them even more difficult. So on the one hand, of course, keep in mind that with the loss of many people in Latin America, as in the US, of their means of living, people who you know, had small businesses, little shops and things, and you know, when you have a little shop in the middle of a plaza, you can't you know, do your business you know, from home you know, in your pajama social distancing. Um, and so there were enormous number of, of people across the region whose little shops just went away. And that's still not even understood exactly what happened. But a dramatic increase in the informal sector as opposed to the formal economy. And again, that means that you have more desperate people who are willing to participate either full-time or part-time in the drug economy, including not only just the things like moving drugs, but also things like, um, okay, we're trying to launder money, so um, you know, we'll, we'll give you $10,000 um, and you put it in your personal bank account. You get to keep $1,000 and you give us the other $9,000. So what they call micro money laundering, um, which applies to you know, businesses as well as, as well as to people. 
in addition to that, of course, um, you, uh, COVID-19 changed the relationships. Again, remember, you had the Mexican cartels, you had the transportistas in Central America, you had the groups in source zones like Colombia. Um, and so it really shook things up. Remember, there was a dramatic closing of borders. Uh, militaries actually went to control border transits like, like never before uh, for public health reasons. Uh, you had the shutdown of a lot of movement of commercial traffic and supply chain. Um, we, we've all lived through COVID-19. You remember how it was, and it was, it was even worse in Central America and in Latin America. So initially, that disrupted a lot of drug movements. It made it harder to get precursor chemicals. It made it harder for them to, to smuggle drugs out. But it also meant that there was a dramatic adaptation of, of the drug movement. Adaptation in the sense that, um, for example, some of the drug groups began to use uh, chartered uh, private planes. They began to use yachts. They began to use greater use of uh, things like um, submarines. Uh, so people actually build, have the engineering to, to build submarines because there is that much money in drugs in places like the mangrove swamps in, in the southwest of, of Colombia and northeast Ecuador um, and, and use it to, to smuggle drugs sometimes as, as far up as the, the, the western coast of Mexico. There have even been drug transits from the Brazilian coast all the way across the Atlantic to, to Europe in, in recent months. But so you had a lot of innovation, you had different uh, relationships. You had other types of innovations, for example, the use of, of UAVs, um, not only to drop things to prison yards and, and to drop you know, bricks of C4 on, onto opponents, but things like using the UAVs to surveil border crossings. Oh, you know, security forces aren't here, this is a good time to, to take the drugs across. And so in many ways, security forces are still trying to play catch up. So that gets us to the question of US drug policy. Um, so um, I, I think it's important to notice because sometimes the uh, U.S. actions get a bit of a, a, of a bad name. It's all on interdiction. It's all on enforcement. And, and I've tried to give you enough of a history where you've seen that that has certainly been important focuses in various different times. But it's interesting if you look at the current Biden administration policy, um, what you see is that there actually is, and the question is how much is a lot, but about $4 billion is currently focused in, in the administration's budget this year on substance abuse programs. And as a matter of fact, if you actually read the administration's drug program and, and you know, some of the documents with uh, the Office of National Drug Control Policy, um, you find that the vast majority of their focus is not on interdiction, it's actually on um, demand in one way or another. So again, these are the seven pillars right here, um, focusing on treatment of addiction, focusing on you know, differences between uh, you know, groups in terms of, of, of who are, are the addicts or, or, or the users, um, how do you mitigate through things like you know, uh, preventing overdoses or, or actually having medical solutions so that people don't die from overdoses, um, more focus on prevention programs. Uh, number six, of course, is that you know, how do you break the cycle? If you're an addict, then you can't get a job, and so you have nothing else other than reverting to be an addict. And so you know, focusing on the employability of addicts, uh, focusing on um, you know, what they call recovery support services. And so you see that only one of, of the five pillars, at least under the current administration, is actually focused on, on supply. Because again, sometimes if you listen to just the media, you get a, a different impression. Now that is a, a fairly significant change. It is a, it is a refocus, but um, just wanted to put that out there. And, and again, if you look across the board, you, you find a various different programs. Um, you know, again, you know, Office of National Drug Control Policy focusing on you know, multiple different programs across the country, what they call drug-free communities. Uh, again, um, you, even the Center of Disease Control is getting involved in this, uh, especially reacting to fentanyl. Now, having said that, though, um, I don't want to make everything sound like you know, sound rosy because one of the questions when you say, you know, how much do you spend on prevention? How much do you spend on interdiction? Um, there is a real question of how much effect you get from a dollar on treatment, how much effect you get from a dollar on prevention, how much effect you get from a dollar on intervention. Um, and to be perfectly honest, um, some indications would, would suggest that inter, it's like, you know, just like treating COVID was a lot more expensive than preventing COVID from happening, treating drug addiction and overdose is a heck of a lot more expensive than trying to prevent the growth of, of communities of, of addicts. And so again, as you look at the strategic, um, my personal feeling is that the real policy discussion that needs to go is not, you know, do you legalize everything or do you focus everything on prevention, not, not interdiction, but really what is the appropriate balance and what is the appropriate level of coordination between those things? So um, again, having put that, let me, my last two slides here, I want to kind of throw out some of the questions that I anticipate will probably come up. 
Now, obviously, one of the questions that always comes up in these forums, and indeed was the topic of a lot of the article that you read for, for today, is the question of the impact of legalization. And for me personally, and I'm not a strict anti-legalization person, but I see that oftentimes some of the difficulties and sidebar impacts with legalization are far more grave and problematic than those who are more staunchly pro-legalization uh, talk about. Um, number one um, is the impact of legalization on the rates of addiction. Even in places like the Scandinavian countries where you have um, you know, substantial legalization um, and, and programs to control the, the effects, you still have a problem with addictive drugs leading to social problems and, and, and levels of criminality from people who need to get the next fix. And if you allow that to happen with certain types of highly addictive drugs in places that don't have the level of social safety net and treatment program that the Scandinavians do, like here, or even worse, in certain countries in, in Latin America, how will that have an even more devastating effect on levels of addiction and the consequences, the criminality and, and other things associated with that? Um, in addition to that, um, you have the question of how would legalization uh, or other policy responses impact the earnings of traffic organizations. There's oftentimes a simplistic assumption that if you just legalize it, all of the illicit money of the trafficking organizations would, would go away. The problem is that trafficking, drug trafficking organizations are often involved in multiple different illicit activities. It can be mining, it can be human trafficking, it can be extortion, it can be you know, a number of things. And so the question is, if you legalize something, do you actually position them to become dominant players in a now legal industry while at the same time giving them a vehicle to use what are now legal in earnings to hide the illegal earnings that those same organizations have in other places? In other words, do you not in some ways in terms of transnational organized crime make the problem worse? It's a question rather than a conclusion. Um, in addition, um, even in places like Uruguay, remember 2013 Uruguay legalizes marijuana? The problem was that the officially regulated marijuana that you could get from the official suppliers was not always in adequate quantity and was often seen as, as overpriced. So what they actually found is once that marijuana became legal, um, you had basically black market marijuana, which could actually be done without regulation on the cheap, brought in from Paraguay, um, and then sold legally. So it was still illegal, but in other words, so even if you legalize something, because of the cost structures, you're going to still have black markets. Um, in addition, again, I mentioned the, the issue of combating money laundering. So if you take something that bad organizations do and you make it legal, you make it a lot harder to track down the illicit streams of money going into those, those organizations. Um, the other thing that we're finding in the United States is that when you have this patchwork of legalizations, you know, for one state it's medical marijuana, for one state it, everything's legal and you've got, you know, massive CBD dispensaries. In, in, in one state it's, it's legal just for certain purposes. Uh, in one state, you know, one type of drug is legal and the other isn't. Um, it becomes a nightmare for law enforcement to, you know, deal with an interstate thing where you have a, pass, a patchwork of types of drugs that are legal and the way in which they are, they, they are legal. So, oh. And so, um, so again, it's, you know, sometimes you have to do a cost-benefit analysis on these. So again, it's a difficult question. Um, it's one that has devastated Latin America and devastated the United States and, and shows the, the interdependency between uh, the two. It's one that raises some very difficult uh, questions in terms of, of legalization and other policy responses. But um, again, it, ten, it continues to kill Latin Americans. It continues to devastate the region to which we're attached. And so um, whether we choose to address the issue or not, um, in whatever way, um, it's certainly something that in terms of, of lives and effects is, is not, going, not going away. And so it will continue to be a severe economic security and, and social problem for us. So thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to questions and answers.